Welcome to Footy Talks. Luke, Stephen and KJ with you, as always, brought to you by Benjamin Moore. All stores are now open. Uh, MLS is back tournament well underway and this is a special MLS is back match preview edition of Footy Talks as we get you set for a mouthwatering match coming away from Disney on Thursday night. Toronto FC and Montreal Impact uh, will be joined by the hero of TFC's performance uh, on Monday. Io Akinola scored a couple of goals. He's going to be with us live here on Footy Talks uh, and will also be joined live from the bubble by Univision's Nico Cantor as he gets set for a big night of action on Univision tonight. He has been uh, producing some great work, giving people some insight into what exactly is going off at the Swan and Dolphin Hotels. But you know what, boys? I am absolutely loving the fact that this feels like it's a tournament. It feels like it is a major, like, you know, you get up every morning when it's a World Cup and a Euros and there's a game on the TV and there's more games to come when those games finish. And before you go to bed at night, there's another game that you can watch. It's just MLS all the time. And it, it's fantastic, KJ. I think it's been a really good week. I'm talking about on the pitch for, for Major League Soccer in terms of trying to get more eyeballs on this league. Yeah, I completely agree. It's a bit of a marathon. I actually need to pace myself a little bit. I think I'm watching too much at the moment because I'm like, I'm up at like, you know, 4 a.m. to do a TFC broadcast with you boys. And then, you know, the night before watching Colorado and then last night still up till one o'clock watching the Galaxy. And then this morning you wake up, watch Seattle. So, uh, but yeah, it's been, it's been great. You know, I think it's been good for us because obviously we're big advocates of Major League Soccer and we obviously watch it for a a business point of view as well as enjoyment which is what professional sports can be but I think it's hopefully from what I'm hearing from other people it's Stevie it's really good from people that can watch other teams you know why there's not a lot of live sports right now for you know that are pushing for people's eyeballs and attention and you know as Luke said what other sport can you watch at nine o'clock in the morning right now there's, you know, there's nothing going on so you get people watching other teams and finding out other players and I think that's an important step for Major League Soccer's evolution, that people become knowledgeable about the league and get to know other teams in other regions. Yeah, absolutely. This is their opportunity, isn't it? When, you know, they've got the eyeballs of the world. There's not a, a lot of other soccer going on right now. There is some, but this is a great chance for Emily, MLS sorry, to just grab this, this kind of market and, and have game after game after game, like you guys said. You know, you just... You just forget almost there's a game going on. Okay, I'll get back to the next one and the next one. Just trying to get to know every team, especially for us with you know what sense with TSN. You, you just want to have a feel of the tournament. And I think you know most of us have watched every game, but certainly uh, certainly a part of every game. You know, just trying to get to it all and uh, get a feel for this tournament. It's been a brilliant week. Uh, some games have been better than others. We know about the challenges and the issues that everybody has, but again, I just want to say. Full credit to the players, you know, they've just got on with the job, the, you know, extreme circumstances in many senses, and they just got on with their work, given their best, made some great goals, great moments, great games so far, which I think is really exciting and bodes well for the rest of the tournament as we move forward. One of the things I never thought that I would hear come out of the mouth of KJ, Stevie, was when we arrived at TSN Studios the other day for the TFC game early in the morning. He's like, I've been up so long. I, I was watching RSL Colorado Rapids at 5 a.m. Like, I mean, that's dedication. He wakes up and he walks to the game. Yeah. Well, hold on. Like, I have to get up early for our broadcast and I go downstairs, you know, have a cup of tea. And there's nothing, you know, I recorded it from the night before. So I'm like, I may as well watch this while it's on. So... Um, and as it happens, you kind of need to because there's references in the games going on and, you know, Clint Irwin's giving away penalties and, you know, all sorts is going on. So, you know, it's true. It's not often I get up, to be honest, on a, on a, on a Monday morning at 5 a.m. to watch Colorado RSL. You'd be right. That's probably a first. <laughs> you know, it has been good and lots of storylines, though. And for, for TFC, I think, um, you know, everything that they had been through with the, the game being pushed back originally from Friday – then to Sunday morning, um, just giving viewers uh, a little insight into our world there. We were, we were at 8.25, five minutes away from going on air with the pregame show when we got the call from Major League Soccer headquarters saying there's going to be a delay to the game. And the conversation happens about how long this delay might be. And then they say, just don't, don't go on. The, your, your best bet is not to go on the air with the show. It's right now substantial delay is what we heard first of all. And then obviously in the, in the coming minutes, we... We, we sort of heard the stories that were coming out and found out that this game wouldn't be played at all. And within 20 minutes, we're sitting, sitting there 
in the studio with uh, a conference call with the, the president and deputy commissioner, Mark Abbott, explaining why this game has been called off. And, and you know, you had an in-depth conversation with TFC GM Ali Curtis as well, KJ, and he talked about finding out just before midnight, uh, the night before the game was supposed to be played, what would happen. And those TFC players waking up to us a 6 a.m. email to say, get on, get on a Zoom call about this. Um, and then 24 hours later, they're putting in that, that first 30-minute performance that we saw that was probably one of the best 30 minutes I've seen from any team in the tournament. It, I mean, Stevie mentioned that the mentality of these players, and, and as an athlete, Stevie, you would know better than, than me and KJ, but even getting your mindset for a broadcast Sunday to then come back and do the same thing Monday, it sort of throws you a bit of a loop, doesn't it, KJ? So for these players to go through everything, and, and when you spoke to Ali Curtis, it was uh, quite enlightening on, on just, just what they'd had to go through that 24 hours. Yeah, interesting to listen to what Ali had to say. And obviously these things evolve very quickly. You know, when you think about it, you know, there's times that's, when we're all sleeping that time just disappears. But when people are awake, the amount of things that can get done at that time. And for him to obviously have been really found out about it very close to midnight, was since subsequently learned that that player that they talked about was again pulled away for a test at night as well, you know, after that as well. So that while the other players are, try, are trying to sleep, and then they fall asleep and wake up to the email saying you go on a Zoom call at 6 a.m. Michael Bradley actually said yesterday um, after, the ga- uh, after the game that, you know, that they weren't told that it was an unconfirmed test, that it, they were told that it was actually a positive test, that a teammate had tested positive for COVID-19. And that shook the team up. And obviously, at that point, they don't know what they're going to do. And so I think, look, you know, there's, 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 no, there's no protocol here, Stephen. There's no directive for players on how to react to this. You know, you know, being around you for as long as I have and showing your work rate towards things, the, the, the admiration I have for players at, at any level of sport is remarkable anyway. The, the perseverance, the concentration, the ability to reach the top, they're there for a reason. Those traits don't leave you when you get there. If anything, they strengthen. And uh, that's the name of the game right now down in, in, down in this tournament is all of, the, all of that and more to be able to adapt and move forward and continue to focus on your job on the pitch. Yeah, the, the winners of this tournament will have the mindset that the strongest will survive. There's no doubt about that. Whoever can cope with adversity the best, the, the, the weather conditions, the, the pandemic, the testing, the, the uncertainty, whoever can cope with that best will be the champions of this tournament, KJ. I have no doubt about that because there's going to be a long five or six weeks in that hotel. You know, there's moments where... There's an inconclusive or there's a, you know, a, a false positive or a false positive. These guys are asked, stay in your room. Don't come to dinner. You know, you're there for 24 hours. You've only got 15, 20 channels and your phone. And so this is, this is mentally taxing. I hope and, you this. and as Ali Curtis said, Stevie, family back home as well, who are panicking about what's going on, right? And you're, yeah, so you're every, trying, as an athlete, trying to put that out of your mind while you prepare for a game must be extremely difficult. Everybody pestering you, what's going on, friends, family, what's happening, when's the game starting, when's the game going to be, answering questions, answering texts, your own fears and uncertainty, is it one of my mates, is my teammates sick, you know, this kind of thing going on, how do I prevent myself from getting sick, how do I play my best in this game when I'm maybe not sleeping 100%, this is what goes on guys, this is how tough it is, and I think that the, the guys who can really compartmentalize that the best will succeed in this tournament and then the group that do that the team that does that the best will win it in my opinion because that's one thing that we're great at as athletes we can we can take real uncertainty or drama or whatever's going on in their lives just put it to this side of the brain and focus for you know 120 180 minutes whatever it takes of preparation and then a game to go and get it done. So there's a lot going on. I'm in full admiration for these guys. I know what it can be like, and I don't think anything in my career came anywhere near this level of scrutiny, uncertainty, and, and, and drama, I guess, within a tournament. So credit to them. And, and, and back to the performance, look, we, we need to mention that. TFC were fantastic for 30 minutes. Absolutely fantastic. The movement, the organisation, the shape, the preparedness of the team, the quality, you know, Pozzuolo was, was buzzing, he was everywhere. Piatti was coming inside, Akinola was stretching the defence, Bradley looked like he had never missed a beat. The communication and, and organisation between Mavinga and Gonzalez, Auro done the right, I could go on and on, KJ, they were, they were yeah. that good, weren't they? They, they yeah. totally dominated DC United for 30 plus minutes till that first water break. 
Yeah, proper team performance, you know, as we alluded to in the, in the, in the broadcast, you know, the relationships you could see already the evolving. And, and, you know, a lot of that is down to preparation. A lot of that is down to the fact you haven't played for four months, but when you go out there and you have your training sessions, that you find a tempo and a level equal to what you can do or close to what you can do on the field. So that you're not going onto the field and it becomes so different that now is the time to switch it on. And that down to preparation, it's down to leadership, that's down to accountability amongst your teammates to make sure you better be on it every single time. That training session is important and you can see the work that has been done during the pandemic with the relationships between Pozuelo and Piatti and Auro and Bradley in the midfield too and the difference from that from last season. All of that is game one and all of that is, is areas that they can ex ex extremely improve on and exceed uh, their expectations even more. Um, but that preparation is key. And that's, a down, that's down to the training. And then I thought they were tremendously organized. And obviously what went wrong afterwards, there are question marks about that and right question marks to ask. But, you know, for me, there's a lot to like about that team when you've got the best players available for them. We talked a little bit on the broadcast, Stevie, about the fact that as a former central defender, it's, it's very unusual to see both central defenders changed in any game, let alone at the same time. And Greg Vanny talked about the circumstances surrounding that with uh, both Gonzalez and Mavinga cramping up, um, feeling it was best to make that change at that time with Zavaleta and Simon coming in. Um, how difficult is it as a player in that position to get into the mindset of where you need to be immediately when you come onto the pitch given the fact that the guy next to you is having to do exactly the same thing. And it's not like you're going into a game where you have to be on straight away with a barrage of things coming your way. You're almost going on strolling through until that Higuain goal, right? You don't have to come in and, and be 100% sharp because they weren't being tested till the end. And then it seemed like just couldn't switch it on at that moment. Yeah, I mean, the only way I can answer that is that I don't think I ever came on alongside my fellow centre-half in, what, 400 and some games, professional games. So it's never happened to me in a professional game. So this, this is a, you know, maybe enough pre-season friendly, but this is a, a competition. This is a game that TFC must win. It counts for the regular season. So, you know, I have sympathy for Laurel Simon and Eric Zavaleta coming on in that situation. But that's where you double down as a professional. That's where you go into overdrive, you forget it's 2 now. you forget it's 10 main, you forget it's 100 degrees heat, and you go, I must be on my game 100% here. I'm not taking any chances. I'm going to communicate, I'm going to organise, I'm going to get everybody where I want them, build myself into this game, and hopefully get to a comfort level at some point. Now, the reason I say that is that I don't think either of the two guys ever got anywhere near that level, that comfort level. The first ball, I think it was, from Westberg came to Laurel Simon. And he played one right across the box to Eric Zavaleta. And it was a risky pass. It was high pressure. Zavaleta looked anxious. He controlled it. I think he got it up the park or he kicked it out the park. And I immediately I thought, hmm, these guys are not really ready here now. I hope they are given time to get up to the speed that's needed for a, a, you know, a first-class professional game. And unfortunately, they couldn't. They didn't. They never really got going. There was too big a gap for the first goal. They looked like they were just uncomfortable for the entire 30 some minutes, whatever they played together in that game. And it really cost their side two points. And, you know, again, as a professional, there's always lessons to be learned, KJ. Now, Lauren Simon's an extremely experienced uh, professional football player. He's played at major competitions with Belgium. So I'm going to sit here and and tell him that we prepare for a game. I think the lessons are there for both of them, that when you're a substitute, especially in these conditions, you need to be 100% ready to step on that field in any type of situation to give your best and to account yourself properly for your team. Yeah, and I think Greg said, Greg Vanny said that after the game, that they didn't necessarily do what they needed to. The other thing too is that you're coming onto an environment where a lot of those players are, you know, you know, you know, the, the, the level of energy is going down and you need to carry the rest of those players home. You know, you carry them home and help them with that and, and, and add that leadership. And I think they struggled a little bit with that. Well, there were lots of positives to come out of the game. We've talked about that first 30 minutes probably being the best we've seen from any team in the tournament so far at MLS is back. Uh, one of the other huge positives from the game was Ayo Akinola uh, getting his opportunity, taking it, getting a couple of goals there. 
Um, Ayo Akinola is going to be our guest right now on Footy Talks, presented by Benjamin Moore. Um, it was um, fantastic to see um, him getting his chance. Uh, Josie Altador, of course, couldn't go. Achara was injured as well. Uh, Ayo Akinola joins us live from the bubble at uh, Disney Swan and Dolphin Hotels right now. Uh, Ayo, thanks for being with us today. Great to see you. Uh, thank you guys for having me. Um, two goals, almost got a third there. If it wasn't for Bill Hamid right at the end there with that hat up, um, looked as if that one was dipping in. But with everything that went on around the build up to that game and then the game, what talk us, what's the last 48 hours or so like for you as a young professional? Uh, I think for me, it was just like uh, seizing my opportunity that you know that I got. Um, knowing that as a young player, you know, you got to make every, every opportunity that you get, you got to make it count. And as a forward, like, the, the most that you can make count is scoring goals. And, you know, hope, you know gladly, as, as I got my opportunity, I was able to do that and provide my team with, even without scoring goals, just, like, working hard, link-up play, you know, running in behind, just what, for what the team needs. Uh, you talk about taking your opportunity. There's a lot of time out over the last year where you haven't played a lot. Is that time for you to reflect and believe that when that time comes that you need to take it even more? 100%, 100%. And even though like the opportunity wasn't there last year, I think it was just for me to just learn and observe of what, you know, like, like what Josie is doing on the field of, and why he is staying on that field. So I think it was just for me to just – I think last year was just for me to learn even more than I did, you know, in the past. Hi, you know, Greg Vanny mentioned to us your preparation heading into to the, uh, the tournament of Florida has been magnificent and it, it means that you deserved your chance. Tell us a little bit about what you've been doing in these difficult times to be ready and then your confidence almost going into the game. Uh, like you said, leading the line then from a guy like Jose Altador and not very little specifics uh, what it takes to be a lone striker within this community in this uh, I think from what I've been doing I think I I think just outside of football I think it's just to become mentally stronger you know I think for me I can honestly say in the past I wasn't mentally strong so I think it's just for me to just just reevaluate myself and just to prepare that if anything comes your way that you're ready and uh, for on the field I think for me it's just been like literally after training, you know, doing finishing drills. Just situations where I know I'm going to be in and just how I can react to it, react to it and, like, where I, you know, where I'd usually, like, finish it, the ball. And um, also, like, speed work, you know, just, you know, 10, 15-yard, you know, meter sprints almost every, other, almost every other day during training just to get that reactive speed of just running in behind uh, defenders. You, you said there you'd been uh, working closely with Josie Altador. And after the game yesterday in the press conference, you, you talked about Josie's been helping you and some of the other coaching staff yeah. players. What's your relationship like with him? And, and what's it like for you to be able to have him to learn off? And, and the fact that he's willing to be able to, to try and help you through this? Uh, no, Josie's a great mentor for me. You know, knowing that we play the same position. So at any chance, any feedback that he chants, any he tries to give me is always helpful I think the the most or what I've learned from him what he's taught me is just to be patient you know I think more so on the field because what he's what he taught me is that you know I, I was naturally I'm more of a person that loves to see the ball you know loves to get the feel of the ball but he also said that you know you know you, know, you running around trying to get the ball is not going to do anything you know especially in certain positions. So, like, he's, he usually would just say, stay up front. The ball will eventually come to you, and especially in dangerous spots in and around the field, around the 18-yard box. And that's where you know – that's where you, uh, you make your money at. So, I kind of listened to him. Um, I, I processed what he was saying, and then, like, I showed it on the field, and, like, it uh, eventually worked. So, I feel like he's been a great mentor to me. You know, he's like – I'm, he's like my big brother, you know? So, you know, I, I love him for that. It's great to hear. Ayo, let me ask you about your first goal because about 70 seconds into the game, you got a ball play, played into you by Michael Bradley and the defender came straight through you and took it off you right away. And right. then you, you receive a ball about obviously 10 minutes later. 
and they give you a bit more time. I said on the broadcast that it looked like a bit of lack of respect from them thinking you couldn't do that kind of thing. How did you feel about it when you received the ball? Did you expect to have that much time to be able to turn and shoot the ball? Um, I, as soon as I first received it, I did. I didn't know I had enough time. But when I was dribbling inside, I knew I was losing time. And I felt like that I had no one to pass it to. So, like, I heard, I heard, um, I heard one of you guys in the commentators after the game that you know it, the goal came out of nothing, you know. So that's what I that's what I thought too. It was like, my gosh, I had no clue who to pass it to. I was just dribbling inside, so I just you know, it was one of those moments where you just hope for the best to str- to shoot, you know. It was one of those days. And when you got your your foot through the ball, did you know immediately when you had it so sweet like that? Sometimes you just know, don't you? That's in the back of the net, did you feel that? Actually, actually when I shot it. I, as soon as I went to the ground, I didn't know. I like as soon as I heard the our team's reaction, that's when I like, oh damn, I scored. <laughs> like I, I didn't know. I didn't know as soon as I shot it. I really, as soon as I shot it, I the ball, the my sight in the ball was gone, and as I was going to the ground, I didn't know what was gonna happen. And then when everybody was screaming, yeah, I was like, oh, I scored. <laughs> and clear up for us on the second goal was was that a pass from Alejandro? Or was oh, that was. Going- <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, at halftime he's like, I meant to chip it. <laughs> you meant to chip over the keeper, so I knew, I knew what he was doing. I don't blame him for that, but you know, as you know, as a striker's instinct, you know, you, you never know what happens in and around the box. You know, you just gotta follow through for whatever comes your way. And you know, I was, I was about to say like, you know, I'm very happy that I didn't stop running, because most times when you see, you know, the plays almost dead, the people usually stop. You know, and hope and just wait for the next play. But like, thankfully, I kept on. You know, you know, I still went for the ball. Because either way, if I stopped, Bill Hamid would have just taped, uh, parried it. You know, ca- carried it with his hand, or would have went out of bounds. Io, you got two goals, but I thought your overall game was impressive. You can see your teammates started to trust you a little bit more to play off you as well. Obviously, when you play with Pozuelo and Piatti. Do you feel that need a little bit more to post up a little bit with your back to goal and play with them? Because you could see that relationship forming as the game went on. Uh, yeah, I can see that. But I think for me, it's just whenever they have the ball, just to see how, how many times you can run in behind the defenders. Because we know they're excellent passers and they will find you. Um, and it also depends on the type of team that you're playing with. You know, is it more, is it a day where, you know, the, the center backs are, you know, a little slower than normal. That's where you run in behind. Or they're really good athletically, so you can just post up. So you get link-up plays running, players you can bounce off of, and they'll be interchanging from players running in behind them. So I think for me, it was just a more of a day where, where you know, I had to use my strength and exploit their weaknesses and running in behind them. Because right for Birnbaum and uh, Briant, they're more players who are good at, who are good when players are in front of them, not especially when they're behind. So, now, I, I actually thought you got a brilliant mix between coming towards the ball after and obviously going in behind. But could you try and explain to us the, the role that you're playing there? Because you are occupying the centre half, aren't you? Trying to keep them from stepping out, I guess, into a Pablo Piatti or a Alejandro Pozuelo. Maybe give us a bit of insight into some things that Josie's told you or Greg Brown and coaches in terms of your role in that front area, what you're trying to do. I think the role, like Josie and what you know, coaches say, is just stay in, stay as much as you can in between the center backs. Because um, cause if you drift off one way, then they're, real, they're, they're no need of, you know, they're not in danger. You know what I mean? But when you stay in between the center backs, they have to make a decision. Because if players start running, they'd have to, they have to make a choice of whether they have to stay with you or they run up to the player. So I feel like it's, it's just more of indecisions for them. that They have to think more, you know, whether to step out or just stay. So I think it's just the – I think for the whole general term, it's just to create confusion to the center backs. There was one, um, you talk about playing with the likes of Pozuelo and Piatti. There was one pass, we've seen it before from Alejandro Pozuelo sometimes, and especially early last year when he just arrived, at times he would make passes that people weren't looking for, they weren't expecting, because he sees different things sometimes in his mind. Yeah. Um, there was one that he played through that 
you know, if you'd said, where's this ball going? Nobody would have guessed. But Pablo Piatti ran onto it. It was in the second half. And he'd read it and he almost got there on the end of the ball from Pozuelo. What's it like trying to read the mind of a guy like that when, when you see that Pozuelo gets the ball and you know that he can do special things, some things that aren't, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not always the pass that you're expecting from Alejandro Pozuelo, is it? The, the some things he sees that other people just don't. And you have to try and be on the same wavelength as that to, to, to think what's coming next from him. Actually, yeah. I feel like whenever, for me with, with Paz, is that like I, I know when he's going to play the ball. When he sees it, when he just has a, sometimes he doesn't even have to look, look up to pass it. Like I just know, I have an instinct that he's going to pass it because if one, it could be his only option, or two, you know, he could just find and distribute to other players. But I feel like me and Paz, we have that little connection where once he looks up with his head, He's gonna he's gonna play with me, and now when I get to receive the ball, um, he ha- he he will also come and support me as that link up, you know, the second kind of link up player. So I feel like you know, I feel like I have an understanding of when he's going to pass the ball and when he's not, you know. So, Ayo Montreal and next, what's the feeling like in the camp? I know it's not another just another game. There's genuine rivalry is real. You know, they played 25 times over the last five five years, and there's been a lot of feistiness and red cards and playoff match battles. This is, going to be, this is going to be fun. You must be looking forward to being in the middle of a, ma- of a matchup against your rivals. I, you know, for me personally, I'm excited, even though I've never experienced the, you know, the 401 Derby. But, you know, hopefully get my first opportunity in the Derby. Like, I'm really ecstatic. I'm really excited. Like, I'm just, I'm actually ready to go out again. And, like, thankfully, thankfully the game is in, a, in another 48 hours, you know. So, the the priority is just is just for us to win you know one for you know to up the standings you know to get three points in our standings and just for bragging rights you know so you know just really excited for that and how are you feeling physically i know the hard thing for me when i first you know got into the top team was like to go again and go again emotionally and physically you're feeling good you excited with your confidence high ready to go into the i'm good, the I'm good. I'm- I'm good. I, I I trust myself. You know, that's one thing that I've really learned about myself that I, you know, like, I, I know my capabilities and I know, I know what I can do, you know, so I just got to trust and believe in myself and I'll be okay. Physically, I'm doing all right. Like, there's no issues at all whatsoever. Just finally, um, you talk about getting your first chance of Toronto, Montreal. Were you were you at the stadium in 2016 for that incredible playoff game, or because you were still part, you were part of the club at that time with PSG too, weren't you? Um, I was actually, I wasn't there. I was part of the residency program with the U.S., so I lived in, I stayed in Florida at the time, but I watched it over TV or over my phone. I can't remember which one, but I I did go. I do remember what was happening, but I wasn't there. I wasn't there. But there have been some incredible moments over the years with, uh, you think about say, the Juvenco uh, goal at the Canadian Championship, the last minute, that, that playoff series, which for me is still the best in Major League Soccer. Um, let's just hope another one comes Thursday night. We really appreciate your time, Io. Congratulations on the goals against DC. And uh, thanks for being with us today. No, thank you guys for having me. I really do appreciate it. Thanks, Io. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. Ayo Akinola with us on Footy Talks. Uh, great to, to have Ayo join us. And one of the things I got from, not, not just from that conversation there, but from listening to him and other players yesterday, um, when Michael Bradley was asked about Ayo Akinola yesterday, um, and you can always tell with Michael and other players when they're, when they're being genuine and, and they have a real feel for somebody or what they're talking about. And yesterday, Michael Bradley just seemed so genuinely pleased for Ayo Akinola a player he said has got the respect of the rest of the team, the rest of those players around him in a very experienced squad for the way that he's fought, the way that he's worked, um, the way that he's progressed in terms of his career. Um, And it was just very telling that when you get someone like that, like, like Michael Bradley, an experienced player, just beaming about the performance of somebody because of the work they've put in um, shows that he's, he really has got that respect and trust of everybody within the locker room, KJ. Yes, that's a really good point. And, and I also think, and Stephen can probably talk a little bit more about this than me, but I think that the expectation and the club and the culture that the club is creating means that he has to be like that. And I also would admit, and I, I was not here now to speak for himself, but he would admit 
and speaking to people close to him and within the club that as short ago as 18 months to 12 months ago, that perhaps that wasn't there. And that, com that commitment from him wasn't there enough. And Greg Vanny has told us that he's a completely different player and person this season with his commitment levels. So look, he's still only 20 years old, you know, so he's still got an opportunity. You know, even Thierry Henry mentioned it to us in a recent conversation about his goalkeeper, Clement Diop, saying you're never too old for, to, for, it, for it to finally click. Well, sometimes you can be because it's gone by and your chance has gone by. But I don't think it's an overstatement. I don't think it's hyperbole to say that chance right now for Io Akinola is now. The chance is now. He's playing in a position where around the world, it's not like the old days where loads of people are playing with two strikers. You get one chance. You're playing in one position. You're basically like a goalkeeper. And you get that moment and you take your chance. Now, of course, Josie Altidore, if he's fit and healthy, he's going to come back into that team. But he can make a case here to Ali Curtis and to others to say, don't go out and sign another person. I'm going to be here. I'm going to be ready. I can play 30 games a season coming off the bench for half of them. I can get you double-digit goals. I can be your man. Or he can get a, you know, a move elsewhere, Stephen. This is his moment now to take it, and, and he's got to stick to it and then realize that these chances don't come along as a professional very often. Yeah, and I think that interview there was, was very telling. It, it seems like he's matured, and, and I'm glad you made the point, KJ. He's 20 years old, turned 20 in January, you know, so he's, he's, he's a baby 20, you know. He's, he's still got so much to learn in his, his professional career, and it, it sometimes just takes a while with the maturity. Different players have physical uh, development at different times, and mental development at different times, and he's a guy who's also talent. He's always been well sought after. He's played all the way through the, the, the U.S. youth international system. TFC were very excited when you know they got him on board, and so right. he's always been a guy that's had that, that talent side. And maybe he's not quite married it with the mental maturity until now. Hopefully, this is his moment because it, it needs to be. Because once you start to get into the, the 20, 21, 22, you, you do have to capitalise on it. You know, you're, you're not going to. You know, Terry already told us you can always develop it, but really, in reality, by the time you hit your sort of 23, 24, 25, that's you. You know, you can always improve things, but you are who you are. And so, I, I think this is his moment. I totally agree with you. Altador's not fit. Who knows when and if he's going to be? He's a guy that historically has always picked up injuries as well. So, there is a, a second striker role there off the bench or some meaningful starting minutes for uh, Iowa Canola at the moment, who has the confidence over, say, Patrick Mullins. But he has to keep that up. You can't rest on your laurels at this level, KJ. This is the thing. Every day in training, needs to get better. He needs to improve more. He needs to do it in the games. He needs to score the goals, have the assists, have the big moments. Because if you start to think you're there and you just drop your guard for that little minute, then the chance will leave you again. So I, I sincerely hope that that interview is uh, an insight into the way that he feels and the, the changes that have happened within him and uh, his season's going to go from strength to strength. I'm sure, knowing you, Stevie, that from the moment you broke through as a professional, that mental aspect, that mental side of it was there. It wasn't something that you had to find a way to, to get to a certain point. I was saying there that he's learned over the last few months you know, that mentally he needs to develop and, and be stronger and be better. But maybe from other players that you've played with and have been around that you've seen have that journey of not quite being there to, to getting there mentally, how do you help them? What, what, what is, what's that missing piece? Is it, is it just about getting older and learning from people around you? How does, how does he go from where he was to where he is now, for example? Yeah, I think it's important to recognise that there's different sides to the, the mental aspect of look. You know, like a guy like me who was always obviously committed and you know, was to be relied upon in a certain sense in terms of, you know, my, my wholeheartedness and going into games was, was always there. It was in me. I was lucky. It was, it was one of the fortunate attributes that I had. But I can remember vividly to, you know, my first few games within the Premier League with Newcastle United and sitting on the bus on the way home from, from my debut at Manchester City and, you know, being delighted that I'd played. And then the dread, the realisation that, oh my God, i got to get up to that level again next week. I don't know how I'm going to recover and train and prepare and, you know, take that mental break and then get up there again. So in the early days of your career, that's such a difficult thing for a player. And then you hit, you know, 28, 29, 30 kg and you've played hundreds of games and 
you, you, you know your cadence, you know your rhythms, and you know how to kind of control that. But when you're a kid, when you're a young man, you don't know how to control that. That is so difficult. And so the consistency becomes really hard to achieve. So I think that's where Iowa Canola is at. You know, he's figured out, okay, this is where I need to be sort of every day, every match day, every training session. But how do I get there consistently? And how do I recover when I need to recover and switch my mind off? And is that an early night or is that listening to my music or watching my kind of movies? Or what is my thing that allows me my mental break so that I can then have the energy, the mental energy, to be prepared on a Saturday at 3 p.m. or whenever my game is? That's what he's got to figure out. That's his next step. Once he gets that, he's a true professional football player and he'll play hundreds of games. And then that comes down to the dedication as well. You know, the one thing he's got is in his favor, as I keep saying, is that he's got that environment of professional athletes around him that can really be an enormous learning curve for him, you know, in negative moments and positive moments. You know, it, you know the, what we're all, what a lot of people I find in any, young, in any business is, you know, even in, when I talk to people in our business, the young people, they're all searching for, for, for feedback and how am I doing? And so a lot of people find that here and they go looking for it in other areas where they don't necessarily need to do that anymore. You know, I can pretty much guarantee it that Ayo Akinola went on his phone after the game and typed his name in and was looking at what everyone was saying about him because he scored two goals for Toronto FC. He's 20 years old. You know, that's the kind of thing that somebody would do who's 20 years old that goes, goes on, on live on TSN and talks about a game. But when you get to our age and you move forward and you work together in, a, in, a, in an environment, it doesn't, you don't, worry about that stuff because you focus on your own performance and Michael Bradley didn't go on his phone and type in Michael Bradley on Twitter because he didn't need to he doesn't care and those are things that are really important because then he can instead of the next day, next time he doesn't need to do that because what Michael Bradley says to him is far more important than some guy hiding behind an avatar on Twitter and then what Greg Vanny says to him the next training session and that's how you evolve and you learn and you don't fall into the trap of believing your own hype and that you realize that it's just one game and it's two matches and two three games and then another goal comes and then you start to evolve and the people you look for for feedback are the people that can really get you better in that environment that coaching staff and I think it was really telling when we asked him the question and he talked about the DC United defenders and what their tendency was and that's because he's paying attention to his coaching staff He's paying attention to the feedback that they're giving him and the video work. And he's realizing that these guys, and he's in the mind of a center-back. And he knows what those center-backs are thinking. And he knows, by the way, now that Rudy Camacho is not going to be thinking the same as Frederick Briant. So he goes in the next game thinking different things. And that's how you move forward. He isn't just thinking about himself in a 20-year-old mind. Oh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm a TFC player. No. How do you get better? How, what are these guys thinking about me? And then obviously the, the evolution of the brain starts moving forward. And I think that's really important. I think it was a telling interview. I could see massive signs of maturation already. Yeah. And, and that's exciting for TFC. And when we talked to Ali Curtis towards the end of last year, he was, uh, he was talking about, you know, whether or not the team might need to, to look to strengthen up top in light of Josie Altador and can he play all the season? They need someone who can push him and be there uh, when Josie Altador can't go. Um, I don't even think, having heard Greg Vanny talk last week when um, Achara got injured, that Io Akinola would have been in the team if Achara mm -hmm. had been fit because Achara was playing that central role in a scrimmage at BMO Field, um, the Altador role, if you like, when he got injured and, and got that uh, ACL that's keeping him out right now. So it would probably have been Achara's opportunity to take. But as, as Io Akinola said there right off the top, when you get the opportunity, you have to take it. It came his way, uh, and he certainly did. Um, we were hoping to be joined by Univision's Nico Cantor, but to life in the bubble is crazy, and he has just been pulled in a different direction to go and uh, do something for his proper job. So we'll try and catch up with Nico. Oh, Hey, yeah, that's swimming, swimming pool interviews. It's probably with his mate David Beckham in the pool right now, hanging out. Maybe. Uh, apparently, David Beckham, according to the ESPN broadcast, is watching from from uh, England. Yes. Well, John Champion said as he cycled past his house, he knows where he lives. So. Yes. Uh, and just uh, you know, friend of the show, John Champion. Friend of the show, John Champion. So, if you've got any questions, either on Facebook or on Zoom, send us a. We'll have a Q and A for the the next few minutes. If you've got anything that you want to address here. Um, Dave Hagelar has asked, is Liam Fraser an option for TFC at centre-back? Stevie, you know Liam pretty well. You've worked with him as well with Canada. Um, is he an option at centre-back for TFC? I think he's played there before, actually, against DC United. Uh, maybe it was a season or two ago, and he did really well. 
I think Liam's an a extremely intelligent football player, so I can see him playing a number of positions in his career. Um, I don't think centre-back's his best position. I think he's a central midfield player. I think he's a wonderful passer. But I definitely think he could do a job there. And, and I think it's important to say that everybody has bad games. Gosh, I had quite a few of them myself, I promise you that. I don't, be- I don't believe that. I, I can promise you. And, and it's how you react to the bad games and, and the, uh, the bad moments. And, and you know, Laurent Simon, like I've said earlier in, in, in this show, is an extremely experienced guy. He, he's played at the highest level. He, he knows what it takes to be uh, a, a top-level football player. And I think he knows his deficiencies and I think he knows his strengths. And he has his own levels of preparation, how he gets ready for a game. And he'll know that he wasn't to his usual standards uh, on Monday morning. Didn't, but, miss a beat, didn't miss a beat in the playoffs, Stevie, when Omar Gonzalez was injured. Brilliant in the playoffs, was, was a, a great deputy for Gonzalez. And in some ways, was maybe unfortunate not to even play the final. Such was his form. Uh, but And Eric Zavaleta has played some great minutes for TFC in his career. Now... It's how they respond to this. I, I think it's unfair to write off their careers at this moment and start thinking about Liam Fraser in the back line. I think someone asked me on Twitter this week about Michael Bradley dropping back there and, and playing central defender. It's, it's one thing deputising in that area, KJ. It's another thing consistently playing there. It's the mindset of a defender that's different from a Michael Bradley or a Liam Fraser. Now, if they totally transition and they go into that area and they, they become central defenders, then that's one thing. But I, I don't think either of them are best utilised in that player. And I think that it's unfair on Zavaleta and Simon to completely write them off because they came off the bench in 100 degrees heat and didn't have their best games. And by the way, neither of the two of them made an out, outrageous error or anything like that. They just never had their best games, you know. And so I, I think that TFC fans should just maybe you know, hold it a little bit and just give them the benefit of the doubt. And uh, and I think that they'll be back for other games personally. Yeah, I mean, fans are irrational. So it's the, I think they're, they're emotional and I understand the reaction to what they say. You know, I do think, in, I think in modern day sport, and I said this yesterday on TSN a little bit, that roles are very important to define. And I think that someone like Eric, Eric Zavaleta not necessarily Lawrence Simon, but I think Eric Zavaleta has got to understand that the roles going forward are likely to come on in those positions, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. I actually think Richie Larea as his teammate is a great example of it, where you can really have a mindset to say, I can make a difference and play in this position and then start to excel in it. I think particularly in the modern day game where in this game now with five substitutions, you're going to see it more often where you can get that opportunity and you've got to be ready. And I do think that they've got to show an ability to Greg Vanny where he can gain, regain a little bit of trust. But I, I'm like you. I don't think it's very fair to just point out the two of them. I mean, I talked about them a little bit on TSN yesterday for a reason, but I think that I do think there is something to the fact, and I know Michael Bradley didn't say, didn't agree with this when he was asked, but I do think there's something to the fact that there's a collective thing that needs to be worked on at TFC, and that's down to the engagement defensively from minute one to minute 90. And, you know, that wasn't there last season. It wasn't there during the run, the run towards the playoffs. And Greg Vanny, if you sit down privately with him and talk to him about it, would admit that. And I think that's the next level for this team. You know, we all talk about glowingly about how well they're performing in one of the giants of MLS. They had five clean sheets in 34 matches last season. You know, if that, that is a lot of areas where you can improve on. You know, see out the game. You know, top elite teams in all, world, in all competitions take the leading games and never give it back. And they have had a tendency, even when the best two centre-backs have been there and the best team players are on the field, to relinquish leads consistently. Now, Greg Vanny, Michael Bradley, I understand, don't want to draw a line from what happened in the fall of last year to now with a global pandemic and a four-month gap. I understand that. But that tendency has been there, and I do think it's an area for them to improve on and eradicate away from their game if they're going to be a true elite team in MLS, which I believe they, they potentially could be. And if games lasted 90 minutes, they'd be sat on nine points from three games, having won at San Jose and then beaten New York City at home. And then that win against DC. I mean, the Alanis free kick was just something. But it, it was a special moment for him on that season opener it, back in March or February, it was, wasn't it? But, but again, 
TFC had played so well, Stephen, and then you don't get the points from what is a, a very competent road performance in San Jose, similar to the, the performance that is wasted a little bit on, uh, on Monday because they, they couldn't follow it through and get all three points in that one. Yeah, TFC won't be happy with these late goals. Don't, don't think for a second that they're internally saying, oh, you know what, it'll be fine. And let's uh, forget about one that happened in you know, the end of February and it's got no correlation to one that happened on Monday morning. No. I'll tell you, inside that dressing room, inside the, the, the meeting room, they'll be angry about it because it's a sign of weakness in a team. And we know these guys are very proud of who they are and, and what they bring on a regular basis. And the late goals is a sign of weakness. And so they'll be mad. They'll be want to eradicate that. They, they'll feel that that's possible because of the confidence that they have. And, and I believe that as well. But it, it's difficult just to blame defenders for this thing, guys, because there's a... There's a an air of complacency that seems to come through this team when they're very comfortable. And, you know, a part of me, I never mentioned it in the broadcast, but I did actually think about it a couple of times where they've always been a team that have struggled against 10 or even nine men mm. in the past, Greg Vanny's TFC. And I think that there's an air of complacency. Their possession becomes really um, safe and formulaic and defensive. And they start to, you know, up the ball in good areas. And before you know it, it's, it's moved back 50 yards. I think passive. That's, yeah, passive. Great word, KJ. I think that's a big problem for these guys because they sort of don't know how to go forward without going for the throat when they don't really have to. So I'm, I'm sure these discussions are happening. Greg Vanny will recognise that. They'll be, they'll be slightly embarrassed and, and uh, irritated by the fact they're conceding late goals and they'll be doing their most to, to kind of eradicate it and to stop it um, and to kind of get rid of that complacency that seems to slip in sometimes when things get a bit easy for TFC. I'm really hoping, I'm not sure yet which game, which pitch the game is going to be played on on Thursday night, but I'm really hoping it's the one right next to the big building at the back there where they had the All-Star Skills Contest last year so I can talk about Stevie's performance when he was filming that All-Star Skills Challenge with the F2, trying to hit the crossbar. Complacency came into my, in my game that day. because it, was, it wasn't complacency, Stevie. 20 seconds and then my performance was right for <laughs> that. My dodgy ticker, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> hey, that, that, was, uh, that was actually a really good, um, a really good night that the MLS put on with that All-Star Skills Challenge. And the, 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 I'm sure the video is somewhere on tsn.ca. Maybe, maybe we'll have to dig it out. But uh, the day before, because it was a new thing, the league got us to go down um, to the, the stadium. The, the F2, the, uh, the, the YouTubers who are um, world-renowned. World My son just sits and watches them all day long with, with uh, all the skills and stuff that they do. And they're, they're friends to the stars. And on this day, they were friends to Stephen Caldwell because they, uh, they, they, oh. talk, they talk glowingly on the TSN post-game show as we were breaking down your performance, which for a minute, you were, it, it was the... It was the crossbar challenge, right, basically, but we were a long way out. You were trying to hit the crossbar? There was a, there was oh, a, no, it was the passing uh, thing into, in the different yeah. things with the numbers. Different goals, a crossbar, different distances. And uh, yeah. I was going for the crossbar more often than not. For a minute, I, I was extremely impressed. Extremely impressed. Like, you'd not lost. You, you, you didn't skip a beat from, you know, when you were still training every day. And then, and then it, it just... I don't know. It was hot, I suppose. It was humid. Fitness. It's fitness that, that costs you. It's, again, it shows you the levels of concentration and, and, and physical fitness that's needed for these guys to do it. Because you get a, you know, an old man like me who once could do it, but once you lose that fitness, you start, you, your mind starts playing tricks. You start, you know, you, your heart's beating, you, you can't control your, your heart rate, so you can't hit the bar. And everything goes. So, that's what these guys are under in these environments, KJ. That, you know, we see it in the last 20 minutes of games. You think, yeah. why the heck did that guy just pass that ball right at the park, you know, five yards away from the, the man he was trying to find? Well, it's fitness. He's exhausted. It's, it's mental fatigue. It's so hard. These conditions are grueling. Grueling, yeah. I mean, the, the players, you know, I think they're really often reluctant to talk about the physicality very often away from the environment. Like, you know, the professional athletes, you know, they can run 14 K in a game if they have to, or whatever it takes, but they're happy to talk about it right now. Cause I think they're really trying to show that it is a massive problem. You know, like I was listening to an interview today with Philadelphia game tonight, Kai Wagner, who I think is one of the best left backs in the league was asked how he felt after the game at 9am. 
and he said in his German bluntness, guys, I was dead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was dead. I can't tell you how, you know, he goes, thankfully I didn't cramp because if I cramped, I don't know how we would have got through the game. That's some of my teammates cramped. And when obviously Aronson and Bedoya went off, he said, but I was dead. You know, and then that, that, that just shows you they're kicking off at 9 a.m. in the humidex of over 100 degrees, you know, and back to TFC. You know, you got some players like, you know, Michael Bradley just running out there as if like, you, you know, it's, you know, it's a, a happy days, you know. And I think Jonathan Azorio would have been the same if he was fit because we know how he can just keep running for days as well. Yeah, he's not expected to be ready for Montreal. Maybe game three, Jonathan Osorio struggling with a quad issue. Uh, from Facebook, um, Sarah asks, what do you see as the changes to the starting lineup for TFC on Thursday? Do you expect mm. to see anything, KJ? Well, I think, I guess we have to find out physically how everybody is. You know, I would imagine if it was just cramping for the two centre-backs that they would start. Uh, Justin Morrow, I think he said he had a bit of an Achilles issue. So we'll have to find out if he's available um, and if he's not, then I would imagine Larea will play right back and Arrow will play left back. I think Michael Bradley and Delgado will play. Uh, I think obviously Pozuelo and Akinola will play. Um, so, you know, you know, the, the other one is Piatti. You know, I thought Piatti had a very good debut. I thought he was very um, engaged throughout the whole thing. His combination with Pozuelo was tremendous. He's got a little bit of, uh, he's got a little bit of a striker instinct that I like because he attacks the box, Stephen, you know. I don't think he's going to be that in-behind threat that I think the team really needs. But he's, again, another provider that can come inside his technical quality and play off Pozuelo and that you can see that that's going to be um, really what Major League Soccer is getting to. You're getting more and more of these technical South Americans come over and make a big difference. So they'll be hoping he can play and be fit. But I, I think it might be a bit of a stretch to expect someone who's not played for the better part of you know, 10 months. So I maybe played from the start for two games in three and a half days, but we'll have to see. Yeah, and, and the question is, does Greg Vanny think this might be a game that's, you know, pretty tight and tense for 50, 60 minutes? And then is he better coming off the bench when it opens yeah. up a little bit? I think that might be an interesting little tactical decision there where you maybe go with a, an Endo and a, a Schaffelberg or a, a Gerdo uh, in the wide areas, know that they've got the running ability and the, the physicality to kind of, uh, battle through the first hour of the game and then the class of Piatti maybe coming off the bench. Uh, agree with you with the, the defensive positions, you know, it's just a, a question whether they're fit or not. For me, the the back four would be uh, Larea, uh, Gonzalez, Mavinga and Moro if everybody's fit because I think Greg Manning wants to spell the full-backs and so probably Auro after his, his full game would get, would get a rest there, although he was magnificent. He really was great on that right side. It was it was as good as I've seen him, as dynamic as I've seen him. I agree. In a long time, over a year for TFC, because he normally has that kind of retreated role, but he was getting forward. Second half was a bit different on the left side, um, tactically. But uh, yeah, a great game from Alvaro. But I think if Greg Vanny can pick from all these defenders, that would be the back four, just to, to spell them about. Any idea what Thierry Henry might do? Because he needs to do something, doesn't he, in terms of um, at least coming out with a side that looks as if they um, are comfortable with what he wants them to do and how he wants them to play and to turn up and fight in a, a derby game here, Stevie. I think he has to play 4-3-3. I'm going to put it right out there, KJ. I think that um, he needs to drop one of the centre-halves because I don't think the three at the back work. I don't see it working against TFC's formation with Akinola up top of his own. They'll flood the midfield TFC and they'll get the Pozuelos, maybe Piatti, Bradley, Delgado. They'll completely dominate Montreal Impact, push them back on the edge of the 18-yard box if he plays the three at the back. I think his biggest chance for success is two white guys up front, right, lap a line on the left. Borian is a false nine to again try and create the numbers in the middle of the park for his side. Uh, Piet, Wanyama and Ty Dare. And I kick up the bum for Safir Ty Dare to say, hey, welcome to the tournament. Start showing us why you're one of our top players. Like, give us a bit more. That's what would be my advice. But who am I to tell the great Thierry Henry? <laughs> I think you're somebody. You've almost got the same amount of coaching experience as Thierry, so you're fine. I would agree. I would almost say almost the same. The only thing I would say is probably Kyoto maybe instead of Lapalina. And I think they've got to bring some real pace yeah. in the game. Bring some pace in the wide areas and um, you know and, and win that midfield battle. I'm with you, but it's been 
And if there's been a real reluctance to play a four, he hasn't played a four. He doesn't want to play a four. He only played a four in the second half against Olympia when they were down by two. They were abysmal in the second half against New England. He still didn't go to a four. He got three players there at the back, just passing it around between each other for fun. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. But, yeah, uh, obviously we're going to find out if there's been a, a change because the attitude is something that Thierry Henry, I think quite surprisingly, targeted right away in his first post-match press conference in the tournament. Uh, final question is from Facebook from a Montreal Impact fan. Uh, we'll go to you, Stevie, with this one. He, uh, Peter asks, how do you think Louis Binks has fit in with the Impact and uh, what kind of future does he have in Major League Soccer? Uh, I think he has a bright future in Major League Soccer. I think he's fitted in really well. Um, I, I like Louis Binks. I think that he's got a bit to go in his development if he's going to be considered one of the best central defenders in MLS. Um, it's early days, but... I see a guy who's played a lot of reserve football, who has some talent, but is, is really still learning true professional football. And I can say that hand in heart, because I was there myself one day playing with a big club in England. It, it takes a long time before you can, can really understand what it means to be a true pro and, and playing games that really mean something. And, and I still see a little bit of that naivety in his game. I think he's got a bit of work to do in his distribution out from the back, but I think he's got a nice left peg and it will come. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say very good uh, with a potential to get to excellent, but uh, a bit to go. And I think it might be a year where it takes him a little bit of time, KJ, to, to really get up and running and, and to be the, the potential, the full potential of what he could get to. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I hopefully, I'd like to see him. I think if they're going to play a three, he's got to step in a little bit more. He's got to really, you know, start the attacks you know, from the back. And that's what, you know, for me is, you know, the front guys can be really helped by distribution from the back and stepping in and giving the opposition the thought to press or do they take another step back and then you can really occupy, occupy the game that way. So, um, you know, I think he could do that, but whether he's got the confidence at the moment to do that, we'll see. Um, but I'm really looking forward to it. You know, at the end of the day, you know, here we are five or six days in, the goals are starting to fly in and, as are always with tournaments, you know, I still think one of the big favorites can still evolve. You know, we've, we've had a lot of, you know, ad, you know, much like MLS is a lot of parity. And, you know, I look at these teams and I think there's a lot of bad teams and there's a lot of good teams right now, but one of them bad teams could still win it because you just got to get through and then you start going, you know, look at the Sounders, absolutely abysmal. One yeah, point, they were terrible. They could there. be done by Sunday night. It could be done by Sunday, but you know what? They could win on August the 11th. They could lift the trophy because that's what things could happen. You know, they could just get in, move forward, start to, you know, you win a game on penalties. Then you're in the quarters. You just, it just got to keep moving. And that, you know, Everybody will be talking about that right now. Every team standing down there right now, all 24, will think we can win this tournament. And who are we to say they couldn't? We'll see you Thursday night for the big Canadian clash. TFC and Montreal from Disney It is, of course, live on TSN. Full pregame show starting at 7.30 Eastern time, 4.30 Pacific. Thanks to Ayo Akinola for taking the time to join us today on Footy Talks, uh, presented by Benjamin Moore. Thanks to you for being with us, everyone. Uh, have a great day.